Folks, weekends like these are why it's great to be a podcaster. Take, for example, FC Cincinnati. They have a big game this weekend, and they also have some big moves on tap. Plus, the Cavs could make some big moves in the NBA playoffs this year, which start this Saturday. Not only that, the Columbus crew and the Blue Jackets have some interesting action unto themselves. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Buckeye Sports Breakdown. I'm Mihir Hassan, And before we get into that great action, we have a few quick hits at hand. So let's get to it. Let's take a look at the baseball diamond first. And the Reds are 5-7 and seven to start off the year as they beat the Philadelphia Phillies 6-2 to two earlier today on this Thursday night. But since the last episode, they have been 2-5 and five on the year. It's also more important to note that they did get swept against the Atlanta Braves, went one and two against the Phillies in Philadelphia, and four of those five losses were decided by a run. And of course, Reds manager David Bell has said that it will change soon, but the question becomes, when will it happen? Again, we've seen Bell go into this kind of redundancy almost to say, oh, it will happen. You know, we'll win the close games. We'll get a good work in bullpen, but sometimes, hey, It doesn't work, but it doesn't work out. And sometimes nothing changes, nothing changes with the squad. And and sometimes that's, that's the painstaking thing about it. And now up the I-71, we go to Cleveland for the Guardians. Seven and six to start the year, two and four since then. And that two, two home series granted against the Mariners and the Yankees. Again, I would expect the Guardians to do a little bit better, maybe take one of those series. Again, close down the stretch. And as I mentioned, Mariners and Yankees, two teams that were in the playoffs last year. And I should also mention, too, for a team like the Reds, you're facing the Phillies, the reigning National League champs, and you got the Braves, too, who are the number one seed, if I'm not mistaken, in the playoffs last year. So there is some mercy, but at the same time, when you're that close in a game, regardless, whether you're the Reds or the Guardians, you got to do something about it. Simple as that. All right. Biggest, biggest news today. I think actually more than the Cavs being in the playoffs is FC Cincinnati right now. Not only are they at, at the top of the East, top of the MLS with 17 points, Fresh off another 1-0 win, this time off of Philadelphia Union. They're facing an interesting squad in St. Louis City SC. Earlier in the year, we would have probably touted this as number one in the West against number one in the East. However, St. Louis comes in with a chip on their shoulder with a disappointing skid, losing to Charlotte at home and then, or I don't know if they lost to Charlotte at home, pardon me. They did not lose to Charlotte at home, but they did lose at home. I think it was to Minnesota. If I'm not mistaken. So they lost to Minnesota at home and then losing to Seattle on the road 3 0, where the Sounders just seem unstoppable, save for the one time they lost the orange and blue at TQL. Speaking of TQL Stadium, I forgot to mention that they'll be hosting some Gold Cup matches later this year, come summertime. Could be a U.S. men's national team game as I checked the schedule or rather the venue list. City Park in St. Louis is also on there. So I expect they should get some games and probably will get a U.S. men's national team game. TQL might also be in the running as well. I know in the past there has been a chance, or rather in the past, especially 2017 and 2019, the U.S. has often done a couple of their group stage matches at soccer-specific stadiums and then doing one in an NFL stadium. That could end up happening as well. Maybe Charlotte could be on the list to host that football stadium type game. Snapdragon Stadium in San Diego could also be on that list. Usually we don't see the U.S. going to the West Coast, though, for Gold Cup matches. They tend to stay in the South and the Midwest, and sometimes the East Coast when it comes to the Gold Cup. So, nonetheless, back to FC Cincinnati. And the biggest news actually came earlier today with Brenner, he might be having a deal finalized going to Udinese in Serie A, which is in Italy. Again, we knew this was going to happen ever since Brenner came to MLS. He was a 21-year-old. We said this is going to be the big move for him so he can kind of grow his talent in MLS, in Cincinnati, and make the move over to Europe. We've seen that a lot with a lot of players, mainly when you look at guys like Miguel Almiron. Played a lot with Atlanta United. Almost played MVP-like. 
if it wasn't for his teammate Joseph Martinez. Won an MLS Cup there and then makes the move to Europe playing with Newcastle United. Doing pretty well. Could be playing in Champions League next year if they keep it up. But back to Brenner. Again, this move is not going to happen immediately. And again, for people who don't understand soccer and don't understand MLS, you have to understand how this window works. It's similar to how it works in like NFL and free agency, stuff like that. But you have to understand the European window has closed right now. So it's not like Brenner's getting on a plane to Italy and we have to say goodbye to him. He's leaving in July when the next window will open for MLS players to go over to Europe. So that will happen then. We'll still have some time for Brenner. It will be interesting to see how Pat Noonan definitely utilizes him down the stretch, where in the sense he's going to be making that move to Udinese and give or take a few weeks off. And then he's back to playing fall spring season, which or in, in the sense September to May, in the sense that he did with Sao Paulo in his home country of Brazil. So it'll be interesting to see how Brenner is tabbed in that way. Again, all this info you'll hear right now is from Tom Brogert. He's an MLS reporter for a Bleach Report, Bleacher Report football, I should say. 18 goals, six assists in 2022. Again, that FC Cincinnati team last year was an absolute juggernaut, and he absolutely deserves it. When I talked about the idea of we expected this, we also expected it this year, knowing the types of offers Brenner's been getting. Again, after a great season last year, he and Brandon Vasquez have been under kind of speculation on whether or not they're going to leave the club for better opportunities. Vasquez has been able to stay with Cincinnati until the 2026 season begins, but we knew Brenner was going to leave the nest sometime soon. This being his third season with the orange and blue, it finally happened after transfer offers from both PSV, a team in Netherlands and Nottingham Forest, who is actually right now in the premier league. But the deal goes for, $9 million is actually kind of a loss for FC Cincinnati because he was brought in for about 13, 14 million. So that's an interesting deal, especially where Udinese ends up bargaining it. And it's an interesting deal on maybe who does FC Cincinnati try to get in that spot? Because we know that Brenner is a DP position, meaning that a lot of the money will go towards him. Brandon Vasquez is not a DP. And you've got a few other DPs on that that squad as well my question is is with fc cincinnati losing a dp you essentially have one more role so you have one extra spot in the dp my question is do you take it for a striker or do you maybe show up the defense from what we've seen this year you probably want to find brenner's successor at least for a couple more years for this year i would definitely suggest honing in on whoever's there and Sergio Santos has played decently well. I think he's had a couple of goals this year. Dominique Baggi has also been a solid option off the bench. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be the same without him. It's almost heartbreaking in ways. Granted, it felt like for a while, like we were just waiting for Brenner to finally get on the scoring machine. It finally happened towards the latter part of 2022 after really struggling in 2021. High expectations for him and safe to say he didn't really meet it. But over his time in Cincinnati, he was able to above, like rise above the expectations, in my opinion, especially in the ways he helped out the team in an attacking sense. So he'll definitely be missed. But I think FC Cincinnati, maybe not in this Jan or July transfer window, definitely over the winter, probably check for someone who could play like a second striker role, someone who can play with Vasquez. I think that's the biggest thing. Either that or maybe someone to back up Lucho Acosta and maybe get someone in the draft who could really help out with getting the new pieces together with Brenner. Again, noting some other pieces of the lineup, Lucho Acosta could be out. Now, according to Laurel Fowler, who's an inside reporter at FC Cincinnati, she said that Acosta is apparently out for one to two weeks, hasn't been practicing, but it is important to see. Let's see where he goes. And also, I should note, too, on the injury report is also Brenner, as he did not play today. Rather, he did not practice with the team. So it will be interesting to see. You have the trio with Vasquez, Acosta, Brenner. Two of them could be out for what could be the biggest game of the year against St. Louis on the road in a hostile city park environment 
We'll see what they can do. And then, hey, how about another wrench to throw in there? Roman Salantano, Matt Miazga, and Brandon Vasquez are all going to be here in Phoenix this Wednesday as the U.S. men's national team plays Mexico. Now, it will be on a Wednesday, so there is a chance that they can play Saturday in this rather this Saturday and then next Saturday when they host Portland Timbers at home. I, I'm really interested to see how their minutes are played out. Now, Celentano could get a start against Mexico. I, I honestly have to look that up. Is the U.S. men's national team roster versus Mexico. What we know is that Celentano, Vasquez, and some others are making the squad. When I look at who's on there, honestly, it could be anybody. Drake Callender from Inter-Miami is on there. Sean Johnson from Toronto FC is also there. He's the only guy with caps at the national level. I also, I honestly would expect Johnson to start this match against Mexico. Uh, looking at some other places, defenders-wise, Matt Miazga also got on there. He really bursted on the scene, and he's talked about it before. He talked about this in media avail availability. It's just the fact that it, it's really his time, and probably from, from that regards, he's probably not going to be – he could be playing this game against FC Cincinnati, but from what it seems like in terms of media availability, he could be anywhere, but definitely well-deserved – for him, Brandon Vasquez up top. Jordan Morris is also on that squad alongside Jesus Ferreira. Ferreira and Morris were on the U.S. men's national team squad for Qatar during the World Cup. So there is a chance that these guys could be overshadowed, but there's also a very viable chance they will get minutes on Wednesday against Mexico. So it will be interesting to see how that attack, and especially the defense. I mean, Miazga has really stepped up his game this year and especially in that FC Cincinnati defense that has only to be honest with you crumbled once this year and that was to a Chicago Fire team that they were playing in 20 degree weather at Soldier Field <laughs> again you can make the excuses there because it's kind of viable one of the coldest games in MLS history at least for FC Cincinnati and for Chicago Fire but looking back to the Philly game they dominated possession in the midfield, but I think there was no drive. And that's where if Obina Wobodo can come back for this game, he's your holding midfielder for the squad, been there last year when he came in in May, wasn't able to play last week. It will be really interesting to see how this team performs. Again, against a St. Louis side that has been known for attacking, especially on the break, when you look at guys like Jao Klaus, Jared Stroud, the list goes on and on for the type of St. Louis attackers that are there. I think the biggest question is, especially on the road, you need a guy like Obino Wobodo that can control the pace, control the power. And especially with Lucho Acosta out, it's going to be interesting to see Vasquez and whoever ends up playing that second striker spot. Maybe it's Brenner, maybe Sergio Santos, but regardless Someone needs to step up and control the midfield. That's got to be Obino Wobodo. Maybe Junior Moreno also helps out. Maybe Angulo, although he had a little wonky shift last week against Philadelphia. So it will be interesting to see what happens. But I do see FC Cincinnati walking out of St. Louis with a result. Speaking of results, results are the most important in the playoffs. And the Cleveland Cavaliers will definitely be up that alley this weekend and going into next week as they play off against the New York Knicks in the playoffs, their first appearance in that stage since 2018, LeBron's last year in Cleveland. Speaking of Cleveland, the Cavs have been 51 and 31 in the year, one and two this year against the Knicks, including a 105 to 103 loss at the Garden. Their one win came back in October towards the start of the season. It will be interesting to see the guard play. And a lot of people have talked about the guard one. That is the point guard for New York, Jalen Brunson. By the way, did not know Jalen Brunson could be that good. I mean, New York basically transformed him from kind of the understudy to Luka Doncic to absolute baller. I'll be honest with you. So kudos to what Jalen Brunson has done against Donovan Mitchell, star player at Utah, making the move over to Cleveland. And he's just been lights out. I mean, he's really, he's the one, if there's one person you can say, 
He's taking this team to the next level. Boom. Donovan Mitchell right away. And he's going to really have to show up. We knew the guard play is what Cleveland is really good at. They're going to have to do it against the New York Knicks side. It will be interesting to see almost these teams that go like for like. Again, you talk about Brunson, you talk about Mitchell, but even like when you look at guys down low, Obi Toppin, Mitchell Robinson for the Knicks. And then on the other side, you have guys like Jared Al- Allen, Evan Mobley, even Osman sometimes coming off the bench. He actually had 14 in the last meetup against the Knicks. Brunson led the squad, that is for the Knicks. Career high for him, 48 points in that matchup. So it should be interesting to see what happens overall. And again, I think the biggest question for the Cavs, they're they're in pretty good company. Only two other teams fall in this respective company, according to the Athletic. And it's the sense that they have a top five off or top 10 offense and a top 10 defense. Only the Celtics and the Sixers can also say that. Also, both of them, Sixers are the third seed, Celtics are the second seed. So it's pretty good company. Should the Cavs make it, could be an interesting run for the, the conference semis, although the Bucks are the number one seed, and then definitely the conference finals, should they make it that far. But back to the Knicks. I have a little bit of a grudge with New York. It's a little bit of a of a grudge, mainly because of their fans. I do not like their fans one bit. They seem too cocky. They seem too abrasive in one way. I mean, take a look at the Atlanta Hawks series last year. They get a win, and their fans just go absolutely berserk. Bing bong. Tell me, little son, KD, don't you regret not coming to the Knicks? Don't you regret not coming to the Knicks? Let's go, Knicks! Yeah, that's what happened. And that's what could happen should the Knicks get a playoff series win. They're going to get so much hope, and their fans are going to be going crazy. Those guys, I mean, almost as much as Boston, just give me a headache from time to time. Simply put, do your work, Cleveland. And I'm not just saying that as an Ohio fan, as a Cavs fan. I'm saying that as a fan of the NBA and a fan of at least not allowing annoying fan bases to get through. Get rid of the Knicks, all right? Say, get in front of their path, say, hey, I'm walking over here, and just get it done with, all right? Take a piece of their own medicine. I don't know. But yeah, I do not like Knicks fans. I do not like New York fans in general. Too cocky, too cocky, too in your face. I don't know. I'm just not like that as a person. But back to to the game and the, the tactics itself. Series prediction-wise, it's almost like for like. There's a chance Julius Randle can come back for the Knicks. Now, he was limited with practice. He was a limited participant, as we've seen over the past few days. I did get word, though, from the Athletic that the Knicks have to submit an injury report by 5 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. So there is a possibility that he could come back. And it could be the deciding factor on whether or not the Knicks win this series. One, does he participate? And two, how does he play, especially down low against a Cleveland side that's, again, Evan Mobley, pretty good, but he's also a young guy. And overall, that's going to be a deciding factor in this one. But I think physicality is on Cleveland's side here. You look at Jared Allen, you look at Evan Mobley. They know how to utilize the center position. And I think compared to Mitchell Robinson, who granted a great player, great, did very well on my fantasy basketball team. Just, it seems like Cleveland's just got that it factor overall. They've got the extra home game. And I think that's what matters down the stretch. Give me the Cavs to win in six. So we talked FC Cincinnati. We talked Cavs. Now we're on to the Columbus teams, the crew and at the Blue Jackets. Those are those of those games, those are those two teams, I should say, should be interesting as the Columbus crew beat DC United 2-0 on the road. Definitely a statement win after some struggles away from lower dot com field earlier this season. And to some extent, I should say, because DC United, especially over the past few years, has not been the best of teams per se, but they've definitely been well overall definitely a team that you want to say this is this is good and credit to what Wayne Rooney and crew 
are doing over there. Very interesting game on tap from what we saw in the nation's capital from Ohio's capital team in the sense that despite winning 2-0, they were challenged a lot. DC's offense was flying in electric. Taxi Fontas, Christian Benteke, they knew what they were doing, and they had so many chances to get a piece of the ball to head it in on target. I had to give credit to one at the stop, the goal line clearance from Columbus's defender, and also Patrick Schulte coming in place of Eloy Room, playing lights out right now. So many great saves, solid saves for this defensive side. Again, for a young for a goalkeeper like him, it's making sure to make sure your defense is in place. Make sure to mark your man, aka Christian Benteke, was running loose a lot in that game. Make sure you can mark your man and make sure you can stop the defenses. Offense is working great right now. Lucas Delarayan converts a penalty kick. Christian Ramirez has an all-time finish. That is a number nine type finish. First time dashing into the box, just slots it past the DC United goalkeeper. And that's why Columbus brought him in. They brought him in to score goals and especially kind of create some depth in that position. I've talked about it before, but despite Ramirez starting the past few games, Cucho Hernandez has definitely been the guy. And although I speculated that we could see a two striker system in Columbus, we do see that the older Ramirez does take a step back as a backup. Nonetheless, a really good pickup. It will be interesting to see in years after this, if someone decides to pick up Christian Ramirez just as a pickup, who knows, maybe he goes to Cincinnati. Although I don't know how good he would work in a two striker system. He's been a little wishy-washy and I just don't think Brandon Vasquez or neither Christian Ramirez in that regard, is set to be a second striker who can play behind the first striker up top. But nonetheless, back to Columbus. Big, big test this weekend against the New England Revolution, who beat CF Montreal 4-0 at Gillette Stadium. Borrero, Carles Hill, Wood, and Brioni all scoring. And that too, an interesting midfield. I talked about Borrero, absolute screamer he scored to start off the scoring in Foxborough. Latif Blessing, who has been a workhorse for SKC, for LAFC, now he's in New England. I did not know this. I said, wait, 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 hold on. Latif Blessing is there. Latif Blessing, the same guy that Bob Bradley said, he's one of the midfielders that is the engine for this striker team that includes Diego Rossi, Carlos Vela, and whoever you want as your number nine. That Latif Blessing, he definitely looked like that against New England. So I would say the biggest thing for Columbus, and I think the biggest concern going into that game, is how do you stop their attacks? We know Columbus is going to come out and attack themselves with Celerion, with Matan, with Ramirez or Cucho if he's back and healthy. But it does seem like Ramirez is going to be the one starting. I would definitely see where does New England pull it out? And definitely on the Columbus side, Can their defense and Schulte stay intact? Because that will be the difference between a 2-0 win for Columbus and a 2-2 draw. And speaking of which, the last four meetings between these two sides ended out in draws. So you never know. And again, the environment could be something of a factor here. Lower.com field, especially earlier on, when Columbus is facing teams such as DC United. We saw this too against Atlanta United and RSL. This team at home? Oh boy, they're dangerous. They are dangerous. And I remember saying last week, give them a good opponent and it's going to be popcorn. And I think popcorn is going to show out there. It will be an interesting environment in terms of the weather, a chance of thunderstorms, especially in the first half. Should be temperature wise around the upper 50s, might peak into the lower 60s. So typical football weather, you might get a little mother nature playing its role as well but it should be a great game at down the stretch and i think columbus is going to get a result and i think it will just be enough to give them the result give them two to one two one columbus wins against the new england revolution so we talked about one columbus team and now let's move on to the next columbus team in the columbus blue jackets beat the penguins three to two in overtime today in front of another sold out crowd, more than 18,000 people on tap at Nationwide Arena. Johnny Gaudreau with the winner in overtime, excuse me. 
but it's always the Columbus Blue Jackets are just an interesting enigma. And you're probably wondering why in the world do you not cover this team more on this podcast? Simply put, they suck. They're not good. They've got 59 points in the season. That's the worst in the East. Tied for the second worst in the league with the Blackhawks. Ducks are the worst right now at 58. Got one more game on the year as they host the Buffalo Sabres. That one will be at 730 Eastern on Friday. Back to my point, though. This is a weird team. And yet... They have broken their trend of having overall average players. You get Johnny Gaudreau, Mr. Hockey, a guy that a lot of people touted. And heck, even Columbus Networks were saying, oh, my gosh, it's going to be amazing out here. We've got Mr. Hockey, guy from Canada, guy from Calgary coming to town. Solid numbers. Don't get me wrong. Gaudreau's played well, 73 points in the year. Little bit, little bit less than, say, what Artemi Panarin was putting up when he was with the Blue Jackets a few years ago. At the same time, your de- the defense just confounds me. And this is a team that could have gotten Jonathan Quick. They had Jonathan Quick for like two days and said, nope, let's go to Vegas. You know what? You, you deserve better weather than what Columbus has in January. Valid point, but at the same time, you got to make a choice, man. You got to make a choice to say, you know what, Columbus, you've got – you've got to do something on the defensive side. And I think that's what's the problem with this team. You have the names, you have Patrick Lane, you have Johnny Gaudreau, but you need the defense. Even in games where they go on the road, say like when they came here to Mullet Arena, they lost to the Coyotes in overtime. They lost to the Ducks 7-4. to That was the one that knocked them out of playoff contention, kind of fittingly too, as they lost 7-4. to This is a good team. And this is a team that did not meet expectations. Definitely going forward, it feels like they're going to have to do something else to make the playoffs again. And I think it starts off with a little more offensive power. You talked about Gaudreau. He had 73 points. I talked about Lane. He's got 52 points, 22 goals, 30 assists on the year. Solid overall, but I think you need guys. And again, Columbus has got guys that could be playing like second line or third, like Bloom Jenner. Bloom Jenner, solid guy overall. But I think if Columbus truly finds themselves on a path to say, you know what, we can win games and we can, one, attract good players to the good state of Ohio, which I hate to say it as an Ohioan myself, but there's a lot of cornfields around Columbus. If you can attract players like that, I think you got a chance, but you need players to deliver as well. I talked about Artemi Panarin. At his peak, when Columbus was making the playoffs, he was averaging at least 80 points during the season. In the year that Columbus shockingly beat the Tampa Bay Lightning, swept them to a Lightning team that a lot of people expected to win it all. It it was tough. It was really tough for Columbus, or rather for other teams, because Panarin was putting up 82 points during the year. More than that, he had two other guys in the squad that put up at least 60 points. Simply put, this team is going to have to find some ways to generate some defense and maybe turn it into offense. They've had great players. I mean, don't get me wrong. You got Bobrovsky on that squad. You had Seth Jones a few years ago. They're definitely, they have the ability to cultivate players. I wish hockey had what soccer has overall, like a great academy program, because it feels like the way hockey works where you can get that kind of one-on-one action, grow close to a club and kind of work through the homegrown process. It will work so great with hockey. Again, I could ask my guys, like I know Sebastian Quinn, Kyle Gregorian, they could probably argue and say, that's a stupid idea. But in my opinion, you could probably use it in hockey and it would work pretty well. But it it just seems like from what we're seeing right now, it doesn't seem like Columbus is going to change. It always seems like they're going to end out Even if they're not dead last in the league, they're dead last in the East, dead last in the Metropolitan Conference. I mean, you can you can work the way down. They'll be worst in some category against some teams in some way, in some fashion. And I think the question is, can they change it as they head into the offseason? That will be a definitely a matching point, definitely a point to consider for the Blue Jackets. If they want to try to revolutionize this team, revolutionize Ohio into a hockey state as well, and really kind of capsulate 
what these these sports and especially hockey is all about. We've seen this before, like with the 2019 run and the 2014 when they made the playoffs. Ohio can rally around a team when they're good, but when they're bad, it can get ugly. And for right now, it is really ugly for the Columbus Blue Jackets. So that's it of my coverage today on Buckeye Sports Breakdown. Once again, I was talking the Cavs as they face the Knicks in the playoffs starting off this Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And hey, if you're right on the couch, might as well stay there. 8.30 p.m. Eastern, FC Cincinnati will be at St. Louis. Some other great games going on. Columbus finishing out. And as always, you got baseball. You got the Columbus crew. There's always something going on in the state of Ohio. It just seemed to be very extra special this week. I'm Mahirson Hassan. Once again, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Buckeye Sports Breakdown. Stay safe, have a great week, and I will see you next week.